Good morning and welcome to another fabulous episode of Fresh Waves. We are so privileged today to have Dr. Petra Hofseidel in the studio. Dr. Petra Hofseidel is a German neurologist, psychiatrist, you name it, chiropractor, (laughs) and she specializes in Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is something that will affect every single one of us, either directly or indirectly. In a room full of people, a hundred people, when you ask, has anyone ever heard of Lyme disease or knows somebody who has Lyme disease or knows somebody who's been bitten by a tick, every hand will be raised in the room because every one of us has in some way come in contact either with the ticks or Lyme disease. We're given a lot of information by the government uh, about ticks. There's a lot of information that you'll find in health magazines and, and written articles about ticks. And lots of the information is contradictory. One article will say something. One article will say something else. There's a lot of myths surrounding ticks. So this morning, we are going to get the lowdown on what's really going on with Lyme disease and ticks in Canada and around the world, because some of the statistics are from around the world, and they're they're very interesting statistics. So let's take people through the basics of Lyme disease. Good morning, Dr. Petra. Good morning, Brenda. (laughs) Nice to be with you and to have the opportunity to talk about this really interesting topic. Well, it's a very important topic, isn't it? Because, you know, for every person that you talk to, they know of someone who has been bitten by a tick who or who has Lyme disease. Yes. In the meantime, yes. Yeah. it's A, a few years ago, it was different. But now, it's uh, like an epidemic. It's becoming more and more. More and more. And it's in Europe as well as in Canada. Ticks oh, seem yes. to be all over the world, aren't they? They are, yes. Well, not all over. There are certain um, areas where they are not, like the Arctic or... Oh, Antarctic, right, it's too cold. But, yeah, well, yes. <laughs> but they are really spreading over the world. So how cold can it be for a tick to still be alive? Oh, many, many uh, degrees minus zero. And they can still be alive? So they're still alive. They don't need much because, as you know, they only have to live on three meals in her to- total life span. So if they have had blood once, they can stay for two years without any food and wait for the chance to to warm up. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So even if it's... Well, I know my dog had a tick in the, I guess, the very beginning, the first week of March, yeah. because it warmed up here, and I pulled a tick off my dog's head. Mm-hmm. So it was, what, six degrees? <laughs> yeah. They're becoming active with around six degrees plus, but they, they survive minus degrees for, let's say, minus 10, minus 15 without any problem. They and are, then they just hatch again in the spring. They warm up and yeah. start moving around again. That's right. They are under the leaves, n- not really ticked in the in the earth, but they are under the leaves and waiting for warming up. Wow. So how does a tick end up here? Because they don't fly. Ticks no. don't fly. No. People see all these little fleas and they think that those are ticks. And in fact... Ticks don't fly. No, so if you see a bug flying not. in the air, it's not a no, tick. Surely not. No, they are transported by other animals, like mice and flea and and birds, for example. Many birds, deer, many small rodents. They all transport them, or their load of Borrelia. So either they are transporting the ticks themselves, or they are infected by ticks with Borrelia, and they transport Borrelia. And the next tick who is sucking on the rodent gets a Borrelia from the rodent. So and Borrelia, like Borrelia is the little bacteria that causes that's bacteria. Right. That's Lyme a, disease. That's a really reason for getting, for becoming ill is uh, Borrelia. It's a little bacteria. I don't like that name. <laughs> well, it's named after Borrelia. <laughs> Dr. Burgdorfer, who found this spiro- is the spirochete, and the spirochete is named after another French researcher, Borel. And this Borrelia is one of the most um, spread over the world spirochete. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So it's it's a pretty strong bug then. It's oh, a, yes. a bacteria. It's a cousin of Treponema pallidum, which is the uh, reason for syphilis. Ah. So they are very close together. In the, the, the bacterias are very close and the diseases are very close as well. So many 
things we already know from syphilis is, again, the Lyme disease. Now, it's interesting because this seems to be a fairly new topic. Ten years ago, people were not talking about Lyme disease, and now they're talking about Lyme disease. Yes. Yet, you and I spoke earlier about the fact that it's actually been around, Lyme disease has been around for a very long time. Ticks and Borrelia have been around for a very long time. Oh, yes. They are not new to the world, but uh, they are newly, maybe they changed their properties in the last 30 years, and so they are more dangerous for for humans. For humans now than they yeah, were before. Yeah. Not for every every animal. Some animals are not getting uh, are not becoming ill after getting infected. Like deer never become ill by Borrelia or cows or um, some other animals. But if you take dogs or, or horses, they become very ill. So it's quite different in the animal world as well who is uh, becoming ill and who not. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. So you'd think that if we could figure out why a deer doesn't get Lyme disease, that might help figure out how humans may not get Lyme disease. Yes. If we, if we would have research in this field, it would be very helpful for the humans too, because we don't have any vaccination at the moment, anything which really helps to prevent to become ill. And not everybody gets ill. Not everybody gets ill. It's depending on the immune system of the individual. So if the immune system is really healthy and they have no additional burdens like amalgam fillings or any another disease or let's say any exogene um, toxin like lead or pesticides or mold or whatever mm-hmm. there are many many modern hazards to the humans yes and <laughs> <laughs> if you are uh, exposed to one of these additional then your chances to get Lyme disease are higher chances is in okay so basically if your immune system is not compromised your you have a chance not to become ill right yes but if you have a compromised immune system you have a higher chance oh yes of becoming ill i wouldn't say chance it's it's very positive it's a risk (laughs) okay so you have a risk of becoming ill okay right so here's a tick it's on a bird And lots of people have said, well, you know, ticks are very prominent in the States, but they're not very prevalent in Canada. But birds and deer and rodents really (laughs) don't don't honor the border crossing. They don't go by customs and get their passports stamped. (laughs) So, in fact, a bird can fly back and forth across the border without any hassle. And they do. Oh, yeah. And then they bring the the ticks with them. So, apparently, since ticks don't fly, they can crawl. And how high can they crawl? They grow from the ground till the uh, height of one meter and 20 centimeter. That's what the research says. Maybe they don't obey this as well, but normally they are not higher like this. Okay. Higher than this. So when someone gets a bite on their shoulder, how would that happen? Oh, it grows from your feet up to the shoulder. It always is searching for a really moist and, and thin skin. So it, it looks for places like uh, the back of your knees, like the armpits, like uh, the back of your neck or behind your ears. These are the favorite spots where they tend to engorge themselves. Okay, and so I guess if they're looking for soft, thin skin, children and older people would be really susceptible. Well, older people not have a uh, soft skin, but they are susceptible because their immune system is less okay. uh, strong. But well, my daughter always holds my hand and says, Mom, it's amazing. Babies and old people, they have such soft skin. <laughs> <laughs> hey. oh, Thanks, Robin. You, <laughs> Thanks for that. You didn't reach the age of having such a soft skin. I don't think age. so. <laughs> not no. yet. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it, then children would be susceptible because oh, yes. their skin is so soft and they're yeah. always playing on the ground. That's why children have to be obeyed, um, observed by their parents very, very thoroughly. So after playing in the and the greens, whatever kind, even in their own garden, you always have to check for ticks as a, as a parent. Okay. And you have to check at least once a day because if you don't look it up every day, they can engorge and after several hours, mostly starting after four hours engorgement, they can transmit Borrelia if they are firmly attached to the body. Okay, well, that dispels another myth I had um, been told, that as long as you get the tick within the first 12 hours, you can't get Lyme disease. No, that's too long. 
So it starts earlier that they transmit uh, Borrelia. So if you get it in the first four hours, then yeah. there's a good chance you don't have it. Yeah, then they are not so firmly attached either. You feel it. If you can take it out very easily, then the chance that you are not infected, it's, it's high. But if they are firmly attached, then it's very likely that they are already transmitting Borrelia. Well, that's fascinating to know. So when a child comes in from playing outside, it's a good idea for the parent then to take a look and look in the vulnerable places, Mm -hmm. which would be... Behind the ears, around the hair. Hairline, at the back of the neck. Yeah, the armpits, the knee, back of the knees, the groins. Yeah, these are the places they are looking for most, or around the navel. That's another place I really like. They like the belly button. Yeah, because <laughs> the, the skin's nice and soft there. Yes, yes. Now, what about in between their toes and on their feet? Not Take so a look, often. but it's... Yeah, not so it, often. Not between the toes. It's I, I don't know why, because my bees they are starting from there, searching around. So right. they never stay where they... Yeah, the grass is always greener further up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like. <laughs> okay, so the, the birds have flown over. They've the dropped deer, the, the tick. The deer are the one bringing a lot of ticks with them. If you have a deer and, and um, they are um, taken out of the skin, how do you call that in English? If, if you're a hunter, you have to take yes. out the skin. And then this skin is fully of ticks, full of ticks. So really? Terrible full, yeah. So thousands of ticks. And even your moose here in Canada, the moose, there are some moose which are called white moose because they are so... Um, sucked off blood that they are becoming white. Wow. Yeah. I've seen a, a, a movie about it. It's amazing. They are dying because of an anemia after being attacked exposed by ticks? and attacked by ticks. But yes. they don't get the Lyme disease. They just yeah. get attacked by ticks. Yes. Isn't that something? Yeah. So would they brush against a, the bushes then and leave the ticks behind, so to speak, as they walk by, that kind of thing? Well, the ticks, if they are attached, you can't... Uh, Move, move them, them off. off them, move them off. But they, if you go close to a bush, they cling on, on the hair of, of, a, of an animal. They okay. cling to it very, very firmly and they never let it go again. So if it gets on you, it's bound and determined to yes. suck your blood. Oh, it's hungry. Like a little sure. vampire. Yeah, it's hungry. It needs, okay. it needs blood <laughs> for the next stage of his life. So okay. it starts with a, a, a larvae. And then it na- it sucks blood and becomes a nymph. And after the nymph, it sucks blood again. It becomes a female, an adult female or an adult male. And the adult male doesn't need a third uh, feeding because his only his only uh, goal of life is to become the a partner of the female. Right. And after that, he will die. But the female has to suck a, another uh, another meal because he has to lay his thousands of eggs. And she does lay thousands of eggs. Thousands. Yeah. For each tick, yes. she lays thousands yes. of eggs. If you see that, you can't imagine. It's like a um, a, a heap of, of eggs, which is wow. coming out of the tick, and then the tick will die immediately afterwards because it's exhausted. <laughs> and she's done her job. Yeah, right. Isn't that something? We're talking with Dr. Petra Hofseidel about Lyme disease. Dr. Hofseidel is a neurologist and a specialist in Lyme disease. It's great that we have the opportunity to speak with you and find out some real facts about Lyme disease. So the tick, let's talk about this tick, the guy who causes, or the woman, because it is a, the female that bites, so or that stings. The, the female is a very interesting little bug, isn't she? Yes, it is. So she crawls. She only can crawl. She can <coughs> cling firmly to an uh, animal or any kind of skin. Including a human animal. Yes. <laughs> Humans have just skin, but the hairy uh, skin is, can be clinged as well. Uh, yeah. can be firmly grabbed Attached. as well. Yeah. And they are really, they don't have any head. So no, people plants, get at that misconception that they have a head. No, they don't. And have. there is no head. It's no. just a mouth, kind mouth of. Mouth part, yeah. It's yeah, a mouth, mouth part. part. is a sting, with a barbed sk- sting. Uh-huh. And then they have two little pulps, it's called, in, in the biological world, uh, where some organs are, the hollers organs, where they can uh, feel vibrations and they can smell carbon dioxide. 
So if if an animal or a human is approaching a tick, they they realize it by vibration and uh, the smell of co- carbon dioxide. And mm-hmm. if this is close enough, they just cling to this uh, this something which is going by, because right. they know that this is a, is something who has blood in it. And that's that, that mosquitoes do the same thing. Yeah. So it's kind of a trait of the insect world. So they, they sense your carbon monoxide and they sense you're warm yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and moving. Right. And therefore, you're going to be lunch. That's that's <laughs> true. And they belong to the spiders. So ticks belong to spiders, to the group of spiders. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Which makes them even just that more easy to hate. <laughs> no, <laughs> For me, no, I don't no. like spiders. And maybe an interesting fact is they start with six legs only when they are a nymph. Oh. So the use of the tick is called nymph, and they have six legs. But then it transforms to a adult female, and then it, they have eight legs. So if you want to know what kind of animal was it that you uh, uh, infected, then you only have to count the legs, because the chances that you are infected are higher when you are bitten, in parentheses bitten, by a nymph. 75% of all infections are transmitted by a nymph. And the nymphs are even smaller. They're oh, like yes, much smaller. They are c- sesame seed uh, size, the size of a s- of sesame, a seed. sesame seed. Sesame seed, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the sesame seeds are very, very small. Tiny. Yeah, sure, they are, and they are small too. You can have it in the the uh, lashes of your eyes, and you yeah. wouldn't see it because it's so small. Wow, that's really tiny. It's it that makes it just harder to to find and to get. Yes. yes. Now, yes. when they bite you. They don't sting like a mosquito, do they? No. They they have a, a, a barbed uh, sting, so mm-hmm. they can't re- re- retrieve, um, put back the sting anymore. So okay. They are, they are firmly attached. Okay. They can't fall off anymore. Once they have ticked in your skin, they are firmly there. And after a while, they even excrete something which is like a concrete so it makes it even more firm. So it's not easy to take them out. Isn't that weird? It's very they're clever. very clever. Oh, they're very clever. They are very much adapted to the world, more, much more than we are. <laughs> they are much longer on the world than we are. So if they, they cling to you, how come you don't feel them bite you? They have something in their saliva which prevents it. It's a local anesthetic. They are giving to your skin, though you don't realize it. So a mosquito stings you and you feel the sting and you smack it. But a tick stings you and you don't feel it at all. No, you don't feel it and you don't get an itchiness afterwards. So it's very clever. So they are very hiding. Highly adapted, aren't they? Mm-hmm. So yeah. you don't even get an itchy. The, the tick no. bite doesn't itch. It, it can happen that after they are attached, even after they have fall off after their full meal, then you get an itchiness. And then you see some changes on the skin too that gets a bluish color or a reddish color. And if you are lucky, then you get a real erythema migrans, which is a so-called bull's eye rash. And then you know for sure that you are infected. That's the only definite and sure sign of infection, besides a lymphocytoma and besides the flu-like symptoms, which are in the beginning too. But the easiest to recognize, it's, it's a skin reaction. And so this skin reaction, if um, I know radio is one of those medias that is really hard visually, but it looks like a bullseye. It's a red center, then a, a red ring around that a few and a white centimeters. In between, yeah. yeah, and the white yeah. in between. And you can look that up online. Sure. Mr. and Mrs. Google have lots of pictures of, <laughs> of bullseye bites and different tick but bites. Don't forget that the bullseye is not always a bullseye. The erythema migrans can have many different shapes, oval or etched out, or even between. if you have it between the fingers or the toes, you hardly can see it because it's just adapted to the anatomy. Oh, I see. So or if you have really it on sneaky. the armpit, you will not see a bullseye. You, you see something different, like a, just a reddishness. Okay. But you can have this bullseye rash, but only 40% of people get bullseyes? 40 to 60. So okay. take it 50, every second might get it. Okay. And this is already a good sign because if you have a local reaction to the infection, that, that shows you that the immune system is active. But if you don't get it, 
you are belonging to the group which are more prone to getting a chronic disease of it. Because right. the, the immune system is already too weak to react to that local infection. So it will be weak in, in fighting it in the immune system when it's uh, systemic. It's the same. Okay. So if you get the bullseye, it's actually probably a blessing in disguise because yeah. then you know the bullseye, does that always mean you have Lyme disease? Always. Always. Okay. There's nothing, no other disease which makes such a typical reaction. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. So the, the tick crawls on you. Yes. Finds nice soft skin somewhere. Mm-hmm. Has itself a meal, puts its mouth in you, starts sucking <laughs> your blood. You. <laughs> How long can it stay on a human body? Oh, don't ask me this. It's more than 10 days we're observed that they are staying if you don't realize it. Like wow. having it on a, in, in a, on a hidden place, it's, and you can't feel it, and then you will not see it for a long time. And they stay as long as they are hungry, and they are very hungry. Wow. So, so my dog that I pulled a tick off on at yeah. uh, the beginning, the first week of March, um, she could theoretically have had that tick on for the whole... Ten days already. Ten yeah. days. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. And then when they finish drinking... They just fall off. They then just they fall, fall off. off because they are so grown in the meantime that they hardly can have a, uh, a, a sting anymore because the sting in comparison to the body is so small then yes. they really fall off. Because uh, there is a picture on Facebook, if anyone goes to my Facebook page, Brenda Masson on Facebook, you can see that there's uh, a picture of my dog's head with a tick in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's quite big. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how long that tick was there because yeah. I wasn't home. Um, it was uh, tried to, to figure out how long the tick was attached by measuring the, thi the size of a tick in comparison to the head well, head part mm -hmm. and this there are some yeah some information that if it's let's say three times bigger than uh, as the origin then it's been two days and so on so they they have tried to measure it out by by this hmm. to see how long it was on on the host and if it's been longer than one day the, the chance to be infected is very high so the host has to have um, the tick on them for about four hours. Minimum, then, minimum four hours. Yeah. So what does the tick do in order to give you the Borrelia? Because if they don't do it with the initial sting, like a mosquito can transmit malaria mm -hmm. in the first sting. Yeah. Well, the tick is very special, as we say, because the Borrelia lives in the mid-gut of the, of the tick and is attached to the lining of the, of the stomach. Mm -hmm. And as soon as warm blood from a horse comes into the tick, this lining is uh, opened more or less. So the ticks, as a, as a um, spirochetes start to move and they move through the blood of the tick, which is called hemolymph. Mm -hmm. And with the hemolymph, it reaches the uh, parotid glandula. Okay. And from there, with the saliva, it will be spit into the host. Ah, so it just spits its stomach contents, which is kind of like barfing, into the human host. Yes, after a while. Yeah. It takes some four hours. This is gross. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, if, if the tick already was about to, to uh, reach a host and the, the spirochetes are already in the glandula, in the parotid glandula, right. then the, the time is shorter when you can be infected, of course. It depends oh. if the spirochetes are already in the glands or in the stomach. If they are in the stomach, it takes some time to, to reach the glands first, and then they can be spit. So the, the general information, you are safe the first 12 hours, that's not true. It depends on the single tick, how it is prepared or not for transmitting okay. the spirochetes. Do all ticks carry Lyme disease? No. No, no, no. They don't carry Lyme disease. They, they carry, they carry Borrelia. Okay. Spir spirochetes. No, not all. We have, um, in general, you can say every third tick carries spirochetes. But there are areas, even in Canada, which higher percentages. Like in Kenora, they found 73% of all ticks there carrying spirochetes. So it's really depending where you get infected, 
how high your risk is that you are infected. Okay. So you can get ticks tested to find out if they, in fact, Carry. have Lyme disease. If you, if, or have Spirochetes. Borrelia. Spirochetes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure you can. Okay. It's but a that's, method, it's called PZR. Yeah, but you'd have to get, you'd have to catch the, t the tick that bit you. Yes, that's yeah. not, not difficult because it's attached to you. Yeah, because they are not fleeing. Uh, they're not. Flying yeah, they're away. not flying away. <laughs> Although they could fall off technically, and then yeah. you wouldn't notice. Then it. you wouldn't know. Then you <coughs> luckily. Then you are lucky if you get a bullseye thrush. Yeah, that would indicate that you've yeah, been but bitten. But it, it can happen that you don't realize it at all, and then out of a sudden, after, let's say, months, you start to have the symptoms. So you have to be very clever to to bring it together with a maybe you stay in the greens some months ago. Mm -hmm. So it, it's sometimes quite difficult and quite tricky to find out that if someone has Lyme disease or not. So there okay. is a variety of symptoms which they have to have that you can be more or less sure that this is Lyme disease. Okay, well, we're going to take our next break. And then when we come back, we'll talk about what it feels like to have Lyme disease. You're listening to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Remember, if you'd like to hear this show again, you can go to freshwaves.ca or you can check out our YouTube channel at Fresh Waves Radio, capital F, capital R for radio. Now let's get back to the show. We're back on Fresh. We're with Dr. Petra Hofseidel. I'm your host, Brenda Masson, and we're talking about Lyme disease. Now we've just gone over, you get a tick, where they tend to hang out on the human host and how they bite you and cling on and stay clung on for as long as 10 days if they want to have a really good feast. Um, and they reproduce. So after they've had their third meal, they're going to reproduce. And mm -hmm. they have lots of baby ticks. Thousands. One thousands. tick can give birth to thousands of eggs. And it, immediately after birth they start to grow so they start to grow from their birthplace immediately in all directions isn't that something yeah so they're indestructible they've been around since the dawn of time right i mean there's even fossils or some there's some sort of stones that have right. amber amber yeah. they found ticks in amber isn't that Buried, something? yeah with borrelia in them yes <laughs> oh and my goodness so they've been around for thousands of years yeah or if you remember the otzi the, the ice man from, yes, from yes. Austria, he had uh, Borrelia in his marrow, bone wow. marrow. Yeah. Wow. So that's very really surprising. So if you get bitten by a tick that contains Borrelia, are you instantly sick? It can start within two to three days, but okay. it can stay for at least six weeks till you feel that you are becoming ill over the time more and more. But it can start immediately after the tick bite or it starts much later. So it, it's very individual. Okay, and do you get the, the bullseye mark? If you're going to get the bullseye, does that happen right away as soon as the tick it's leaves the same. you? It can be the next day. It can be after three weeks. So it's really very variable. Wow. There are no rules. You are an individual and the tick has a, its own uh, rules as well. So it it can be very variable. Well, mm -hmm. huh? So you never so can not like trust that it comes the next day, and then you know for sure that it was a tick bite. No, it's not that easy. And it's not that you can say that okay, I have a bullseye, which means that two hours ago I was bitten by a tick. It could have been that it was three weeks days ago, ago or, or even weeks. years ago. Sometimes I have seen patients who came to me and they knew they were bitten years ago, but they only developed a bullseye rash after a immune depression. So uh, with another disease coming up, this bullseye rash can cr be created after many years too. So it's it shows only that the tick content, so Borrelia, can stay where the tick bite was for a long time. But on the other hand, we know that it is immediately after the tick bite in the bloodstream and it's uh, distributed in the whole body. So both is possible. So... In one bite, in one feeding from a tick, it can infect you with Borrelia that goes through your whole system. Yes. So it gets into your bloodstream and just travels yeah, around. It's everywhere. Yeah. Now, how come your body doesn't just go red alert, red alert, 
incoming Borrelia, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they try, but <laughs> it's not so easy. Borrelia has many defense mechanisms to, to cheat the immune system. So they, for example, say, have a, a, a coat. It looks like a human cell, mm-hmm. so they are not attacked. It's one of the many defense mechanisms. So Borrelia are also very smart. Oh, yeah. They are the most intelligent germs we know. They have the highest genetic pool of, of many, many animals. They are really very amazing. Really? Yeah. I mean, if they weren't so destructive, they'd be kind of fun to study just because they are yeah, so sure. smart and they're microscopic. Yeah. Like, you can't see them with a the naked eye. A no, 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 no. You'd have to see them under a microscope. Right. And when you do, they actually move. Yeah, in a specific way. So they turn around their own axis. So, so that's a very specific way to recognize them. And they that's can't be all colored. spirochetes are like that? They yeah. spiral? Yes, that's the name. So it looks like a worm, sort of. Kind of worm, yeah. Like a spiral. Mm-hmm, spiral worm. Yeah, it's, the name comes from this form, yeah. spirochete. So the Borrelia kind of look like spiral macaroni. <laughs> Only on a very, very, very small One scale. scale. Right. <laughs> and they get into your system. Now, where do they go? They just hang out everywhere or do they tend yeah, to they, go to big joints they, or your they head? Move, they move actively. They have some flagelle. So these are kind of, of um, threads. or how do Threads, that? yeah. No, flagelle, it's, it's the, the, where they move with. Oh, like little like legs. A propeller, like a propeller. Oh, I see. So they move actively through your body. And even through through skin and and tissue, so not only in the in the liquids, so they oh. can really go through uh, tissue. That's why they are moving in the skin as well. Okay, and so where do they like to hang out? Because well, you hear the different symptoms of Lyme disease. Some people feel like they have the flu. Some people have yes. the brain fog. Some people have sore joints. So would that mean that for some people they go to their heads and some people they go to their joints? Or are they just everywhere and just kind of... They are more or less everywhere, but they don't create symptoms everywhere. Okay. So these are, depending on the person, on the individual, where the symptoms are created. But they tend to to be in sec- recluded secluded. Uh, parts of the body, like um, the synovia of the of the joints, mm-hmm. or uh, fat tissue, or lymph nodes, <coughs> lymph nodes, or any organ which is not well vascularized, because okay. with with the blood the immune system is close. Without blood, the immune system can't do so much, because the immune cells are uh, traveling with the blood. Okay. So the less blood in the area, the happier the Borrelia are yes. because they're staying away from your immune system. Right, right. That's a, that's a trick of them. That's, to think about how they have to process that information and know that, it's staggering to think that there's a bacteria that's that smart. Yeah. And we are so helpless against them because we don't know their tricks, not all them, of them. We only know a few, a few now. But it's so much more, more to be researched about if they only would do it. <coughs> well, I spoke with a man who has Lyme disease, and he's a martial arts expert. And he says that he can bring down a, a large six foot 200 pound man. <laughs> and he's so tough, and he knows all of these martial arts moves, and he eats well, and he's a big, strong man. But a little tiny tick. has brought him to his knees. Oh, yes. Because he has Lyme disease and he's having a really hard time with it. And it, to me, it's staggering, but that was a really good kind of a, a story to be able to understand how severe Lyme disease can be. Yeah. If you're suffering of it, you, you know it because it's really hampering every single day of your life in many ways. And sometimes fog. people don't know it. People don't know yeah, that they it's don't realize that it's Lyme, Lyme disease. They think they have arthritis or any other um, fibromyalgia or whatever they call it or MS or whatever. They have many symptoms which are similar to other diseases. And if you're not looking closely enough, you mistake it for another disease. And if you are treated, for example, for MS, then you get corticosteroids 
steroids, uh -huh. and then you become more ill than you can imagine because the steroids are immune suppressive. And if you get an immune suppressant, then your immune system has not any, any strength anymore to fight against the, the spirochete. Isn't that something? So if you're misdiagnosed and someone says that you have MS-like symptoms, but they right. can't really pinpoint that for sure it's MS. Right. And you're taking any of the medication that's against MS, against MS that fights MS, you're actually feeding the, oh, li the Lyme disease. More or less, yes. Isn't that something? That makes it very tricky. Yeah. And it's a big um, duty of, of all doctors to be thorough with, with their diagnosis. Well, there is, um, there is a way of detecting whether or trying to figure out whether you have Lyme disease. Obviously, if you've got a big bullseye on your thigh, chances are you have Lyme disease. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you only have to be recognized like this. <laughs> but the thing is, because people weren't talking about it 20 years ago, yeah. you could have been infected for 20 years and not known it. Because, oh, right. you know, before I remember being um, in, in my 20s, which was a while ago. <laughs> According to my children, it was when dinosaurs freely roamed the earth, but... <laughs> Aside from that, we didn't talk about ticks yeah. in any way, shape, or form, other than to say, if you ever got bitten by a tick, to make sure that you took the head out, which we know now is not a head, it's actually the mouthpiece, which can sometimes be lodged in the skin if you have scratched the tick off or, mm -hmm. or just try to pull it off with your fingers. So is it still the, the way that you're supposed to get that mouth out? Does that make any difference? Mm, well, you you could always try to get it out, but as I said, as it depends how long the tick was attached to you. If it was long enough, then you can't get it out easily. So you have to cut off more or less the mouse parts from the body of the tick easily with a razor or with a with a string or with a tweezer, and then the sting itself comes out afterwards on its own. But the sting alone is not dangerous anymore because danger comes from the stomach of the, of the tick where the Borrelia are. And if they are already transmitted, then the sting itself, it's not a problem. Okay, but sometimes it can get infected, can't it, yes, if it's left can, in but there? but then it's like a, a, a foreign body in your, in your skin. It's, it's like it's having a sliver. Yeah, like yeah. it's not going to be that big of a deal, no, just no, take no. it out. Actually, your body usually forces it out on its own, doesn't it? That's right. Your body has a way of getting rid of things it doesn't like. Too bad it doesn't get rid of Borrelia. <laughs> it doesn't know how to. <laughs> it doesn't know how to. Maybe someday we'll be able to teach it. Anyway, we're going to take a little break. We're talking with Dr. Petra Hofseidel about Lyme disease. Dr. Petra is world-renowned for her research that she's done on Lyme disease, and uh, we're really privileged to have her in the studio today. I'm your host, Brenda Masson. We'll be back right after this. Stay tuned. You're listening to Fresh Waves on Whistle FM. We're back with Dr. Petra Hofseidel here on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and we're just talking about Lyme disease and little ticks barfing into human bodies and all this kind of stuff that sounds more like a Halloween show, but we're going to put it on in the spring because ticks come out when the weather gets warmer. And, you know, the beginning of March, my dog got bitten by a tick, and this is how it kind of goes. So we're starting into the season where ticks are a part of our life, like it or not. And we need to be aware of the fact that certain ticks can cause Lyme disease, that the bullseye mark is a definite sign of Lyme disease. And we'll start, we'll, yeah. we'll talk about the symptoms that, that are kind of classic Lyme disease. And also the fact that some ticks don't have Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. But when you have that bullseye, you've got Lyme disease. That's true. And uh, <clears throat> and often pe some people don't get sick from Lyme disease. Yeah, it can happen if your immune system is strong enough, you can fight back. So only 10% of all bitten, if you take 100 persons bitten by an infected tick, only 10% fall ill. So this is quite a, a good relation. Relatio. Okay, but so the, if you don't get sick in the first, say, month, then you're safe. You're not going to get sick. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, not no. So easy. oh no! Oh no! So easy. It always can happen afterwards. If you're infected, you can uh, trust your immune system that it fights it back. But if the immune system itself gets compromised after that, let's say a, a month later, 
by any other disease or any other exogen um, burden. Okay, then, so say you had the flu. Could Yeah, no, the flu alone is not strong enough. It's not strong no, enough to compromise real, your immune system? Yeah, no. But uh, talking about flu, don't forget that the f- really first signs very often are flu-like symptoms, not the bullseye rash. If you don't have this bullseye, mm-hmm. then you still can have early signs like the flu-like symptoms. So what do you mean? So you feel like getting a flu. You have a headache, you have um, pain in all your um, extremities. You feel shitty, as you say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, then you might have um, psychological problems like depressive mood swings and you feel exhausted and tired and you need to go to bed for some days, which is very unusual normally for for just a flu. But if you feel so bad that you need to go to bed, then you should be very aware that it could be an early sign of, of Lyme disease. And it is not a summer flu if it's always called by doctors because in summer, if you feel like this, they tell you it's a virus, it's a summer flu. But it's not true. Mostly of the of, of these pe- uh, patients are having an f- early sign of Lyme disease. Wow. Yeah. Now, Lyme disease can be completely debilitating. You see pictures, um, well, there's yeah. that movie, the... Um, under our skin, yeah. Under our skin, where you see people who are really, really badly off. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's like that. No. So it can be just as simple as you just said, that you feel like you have a summer flu, mm-hmm. but you don't have the runny nose. No. Without a running nose. No running nose. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, I mean, there are many symptoms additional and they build up over the time. So you are not getting rid of it anymore. That's the difference. So starting with the flu, that might be still okay, but then migrating pains come up, headaches which never go off. Um, you, You get... Uh, internal problems like gastrointestinal problems, you can have urinary problems, libido loss, many, many things come up over the time and you don't know that's all one picture of the disease. So you go from specialist to specialist with your sim- symptoms and the specialists say, no, I can't find anything, you are healthy, it's all in your head. And it might be, there might be a whole bunch of Borrelia in your head (laughs) (laughs) that causes the brain fog. But it's, um, so if it's in your head, it's, that's one of the symptoms as well, isn't it? That people experience brain fog. Cognitive problems, yeah. Right. And there's Memory loss, some, all this. some famous people you, you hear oh, about yeah. these things on Facebook or wherever, and sometimes you don't know if they're credible or mm-hmm. not. Actors. Yeah, but actors, uh, Avril Lavigne, Singer. for example, yeah, who, right. had, who has um, attributed her symptoms to Lyme disease. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting when you start to become aware of the symptoms and you look on your list, that often it's not just one of these symptoms. It's no. not just that you have brain fog. It's that no. you brain fog and then you have a sore knee. No. It's always and then, a combination. And then... Another time you have a sore elbow and another time you have, yeah. I mean, if it's always that one shoulder is sore forever, then... Then it's a shoulder. It's a shoulder. a problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this, the migrating uh, symptoms, this is a very definite sign of, of Lyme disease. It's a changing all over the body. And it changes not only with the extremities, but you can have it internal as well, as I said, cognitive problems. You even have hormonal changes like thyroid problems or problems with a uh, urinary tract by um, low ATH, which uh, if it's low, then you have to go to toilet very often because your urine is not concentrated anymore. So you have to go very, very often, and it's very annoying, Mm -hmm. especially at nights. Yeah, (laughs) I can imagine (laughs) waking you up every now and again. Um, So it's a combination of these things that would trigger you as someone who knows about Lyme disease to look for Lyme disease. But sure. you can see where people wouldn't know that they had Lyme disease. You could see where it would be, you know, someone says, oh, well, I've got fibromyalgia. Mm-hmm. I'm just tired all the time. Then I would always ask, since when? Because it has a starting point. And if the starting point is been when they were in the woods or if they remember having had a, a tick or so. Where they so, grew up on a farm. Yeah, like this. <laughs> you always have to ask the, the medical history. That's very important for pinpoint, pinpointing if you have Lyme disease or not. 
So we've talked a bit about the symptoms and how sporadic the symptoms are and how you could easily see how someone would be misdiagnosed, especially if they didn't have a bullseye, especially if they've never noticed that they've been bitten by a tick. There are many, many symptoms and it makes it sometimes very difficult for the doctors to recognize it because of the many different symptoms. And I guess that in itself is one of the biggest clues yeah. is that there are so many different symptoms. It's a systemic, it's a multi-systemic disease, disease a multi-systemic yeah. disease. Multi-systemic. Yeah. Yeah. And it can present in different ways. Now, I've heard that there is a questionnaire online yes. that you can go to. So is it on your website? It's on my website, but it's... Uh, and it's uh, also on Dr. Accessible. Horowitz's yeah. website. Now, Dr. Horowitz is in New York City. Right. And he's, um, again, very, very knowledgeable about Lyme disease as well. And it's the same survey. So it's it asks you what your symptoms are, and you make check marks beside right. what your symptoms are. And you get points. Yeah, and uh, according to the points, you have uh, probability of being infected by Lyme or not, by by Borrelia or not. Okay, mm -hmm. so this isn't a system where you want to collect as much points as possible. <laughs> 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 no, you, you don't get a prize at the end, other than finding a out, I guess, what's wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that's a really valuable thing. People like to know what's wrong with sure, them. It's very then you frustrating. Know how to go further what you can do for treatment mm -hmm. and the treatment is not so difficult you only have to know which kind of antibiotics are effective and they have to be given for a long time not for 10 days yes. minimum is 30 days because a tick as a, as a Borrelia rep, uh, replicates within 28 days so it's a long long time If That's very slow for a bacteria. Don't oh, yes. bacteria you, usually multiply by the millions by the second or something like that? By minutes. So like yeah. Escherichia coli, for example, E. coli, E. coli, you call it. Yeah. They are, within 20 minutes, they are divided. Really? And, and multiplicated, yeah. But not so with Borrelia. No, Borrelia takes 28 days and this is quite a long time. It is a long time. Mm -hmm. Are there any other diseases that take that long? Yeah, take lepra, tuberculosis. These are the diseases which are treated very long. Yeah. For years, and only Lyme disease with the same uh, regeneration time is treated with 28 days. That doesn't work. So the recommendation by the guidelines says maximum 21 to 28 days of a t antibiotic treatment. But this is stupid because it doesn't fit with the uh, replication time of the of the germs. So you'd need 30 days as a minimum. As a minimum, yeah. And that's that's weird because I know lots of times when I've I've heard from people who have had Lyme disease and they go to a doctor here and they'll say, well, if you really think you have Lyme disease, first of all, they give them amoxicillin, which we know is not a drug of choice. And they give them amoxicillin for 14 ten days, days yeah. 10 days. It's stupid. It doesn't do anything. It really doesn't do anything to it the It might germs. make you feel better, but it doesn't... No, not, it even, doesn't, that. not yeah. even that. You can even have side effects like a, a rash. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, not the right thing to do. So what is the drug of choice for most Lyme disease? You can either take microlytes like claritromycin or azithromycin, or best of all is minocycline, which is a tetracycline. The tetracycline is much better because it goes into your brain. The minocycline has a, a way to go through the blood-brain barrier, and this is necessary when you have a brain fog and all these mental problems. So you need a drug who goes into your brain and into the cells. So it has to be both properties, going right. into the cells and into the brain. And the only one I know well enough is minocycline. And is that available in most places? It seems oh, yeah. it's an old drug, isn't it? Because it's the an tetracycline, old drug for acne, yeah. yeah, it's available in Canada. It's called Minocene, if I'm not mistaken, and it's available, and it's cheap because there is no um, patent, patent anymore yeah. on it. I and guess that's why the big drug companies don't want to do anything about it yeah, because well, they don't make money. But it, it's cheap for for prescribing too for the doctors, so it's not a, a big deal, and you could easily. Prescribe it for 30 days as a minimum, and as I said, better is two months than one month's treatment. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the symptoms, of course. Maybe after one month you're okay, but mostly it's not the case. So some people have to go on antibiotics for even longer than a month. Yeah. Especially if it's a chronic. Yeah. If you're already chronic, you, you need more time. 
So thanks again for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to have you on Fresh Waves. And we hope that uh, through this information, we can help people at least get some more yeah. information. Thank you, Brenda, for the opportunity to talk about it, because this is the most important part to spread the, the information. Spread the news. And the news. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. We've had a great show today. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Fresh Waves podcasts can be heard anytime you like on freshwaves.ca or subscribe to our YouTube channel, Fresh Waves, capital R for radio. And we air on 102.9 whistlefm.com every Saturday morning at 7 a.m. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you again next time on Fresh Waves.